Amen. We made it here. We're not under bridges. We're not starving to death. We're not down on the border. We thank God that we're here. You ought to be thankful unto God. Amen. And give him a little praise this morning. If you don't mind, just, just help the preacher a little bit. Let me know that you're here. Won't you give God a little praise? Let him know that you're thankful, that you're grateful, that you're glad to be here in spite of all that we go through. I need a little more help than that. Y'all got to, you got to act like you know him. Anybody glad that you know him? It don't matter how many folk here. Just give God some praise. It don't matter who's not here. Don't worry about any of that. Can you put your mind on the Lord for just a few minutes while we try to pray? I need more help than that. I, I need a witness in the house. If there any witness in the house that can testify to the goodness of God, all that you've been through on the past, any witness in the house, anybody glad, anybody thankful, I need a little more help than that. I, I know you might be a little weak right now, but, but can I get a little help in the house? Can I get a testimony in the house? Can, can anybody get a praise on their lips this morning? Anybody thankful this? Anybody grateful? Anybody glad that you're in the house of the Lord this morning? Anybody thankful that you've been redeemed? Anybody glad that you've just been set free? Anybody thankful? I just need somebody to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank God for you while you're standing. Turn with me to Second Chronicles real quickly. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Going to read in your hearing a few verses this morning, verses 1 through 13 and verse 15. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 20. That's Old Testament. That's old school. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Thank God for each and every one of you for being here. We know we got a lot of traveling members uh, on today, so be in prayer for them that they'll get there safely and make it back as they have been with family. Amen. And friends. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Thank God for my wife for being here as well. God bless you and our beautiful children. God bless you and all these preachers and deacons. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Going to read in your hearing verses 1 through 13 and spe uh, specifically verse 15. You may also read 14. Second Chronicles chapter 20. When you find it, say amen. If you can't stand, please stand for the reading of God's word. Reading from the NIV version of the Bible. Second Chronicles chapter 20 beginning at verse 1. It says, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites and some Meunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already at Hazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdom of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, do you not, did you not drive out the inhabitants of the land before your people and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary your, for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us for an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Verse 14 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Medaniah, a Levite and a descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. 
not be afraid or discouraged by this vast army, for the battle is not yours, it's God. You may be seated in the presence of an almighty God. And as you're sitting, I want to read verse 20. I need you to hear this one. For it is the focus of our sermonic expression this morning. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah, and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. From this area of scripture for just a few minutes, I want to talk about faith grows in the middle of a mess. Yeah, faith, faith grows in the middle. of a mess. Ah, some folk gonna be glad they ain't here today. Um, we learned something last week, and that is God expects his children to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we preach from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. In the Christian faith, when we speak about growth, we are speaking about maturing as a Christian, growing into Christ-likeness. Theologically, growing in faith and maturing in Christ is the process of sanctification. Sanctification being holiness, that is, set apart for service to our God. Matter of fact, in the book of the law, Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says, consecrate yourselves and be holy. Because I am the Lord your God. Keep your decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. Jehovah M. Kadesh, the Lord, our sanctifier. A scripture says, consecrate yourselves and be holy. Yet at the same time, it says, I am the Lord who makes you holy. That sounds like they are diametrically opposed, but they are one in the same. Scripture informs us that God sanctifies us. He makes us holy. Yet you and I have a role to play in being what he's making us out to be. Uh, yeah. Sanctification is our spiritual condition. Yeah. It begins when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. We are born again. Then the process of Becoming like Christ begins. It, 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 it's not about to start. It, it necessarily starts. It, it has to begin. It, 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 you begin to become more like Christ. Sanctification. Yet when you read Titus 3 or 1 Corinthians 6 and 11, I'm going to start with Titus 3 and 5 first. He says, he saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Sanctification necessarily begins, it has to begin, because you receive the baptism and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit indwells every believer and he begins the work of changing us into the likeness of Christ at the moment of salvation. Now some of us resist him changing us because we don't want to change. So we resist the sanctifying power of God. And, and the Lord ain't going to knock you over and make us become what he wants us to become. We either allow the spirit of God to change us and rearrange us or we resist. Yeah. Sanctification. 1 Corinthians 6 and 11 helps us a little bit further. It says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, then you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Justification relates to our spiritual position. That is done once and for all 
at the moment of salvation. You have been declared right when we know we wrong. You are just affied by the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, all who put their trust in him, he, is, he justifies us. That's a legal term, meaning that you have been found not guilty. There is no double jeopardy. There is no retrial. There is no need to bring it back up again. The Lord has declared you right. Ain't nothing nobody can do about justification because the Lord Jesus died and he paid it all and all to him we owe. No matter what kind of mess you might find yourself in, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, he has made you right. Because we can't make ourselves right. That's why I'm always worried about folks who say, let me get right before I come to the Lord. Well, that ain't going to ever happen. Yeah, well, he makes us right. He puts us in right standing with God. And then the process of becoming more like Christ begins to make us the light shining in darkness that the Lord needs for us to be. We become more like Christ, growing in maturity sanctification. And justification is the declaration that we're right. Then he expects us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? Well, it begins at the moment of salvation. It's our spiritual condition, sanctification. It increases and continues throughout life. It's not completed until we leave this mortal body. So we're ever learning, ever growing, and we're always striving to become more like Christ. As the Holy Spirit works to make us holy, we have to cooperate. So our next sermon, sermonic series, is we'll be dealing with areas in which we need to grow collectively and individually where we need to get better and when I say need to get better I'm not speaking in terms of cornerstone members necessarily I'm speaking in terms of the body of Christ generally and cornerstone specifically because that's the place I happen to pastor I don't know what's going on across the street it really ain't none of my business I don't know what's going on at Concord Church that's none of my business I don't know what's jumping off at MFBC, Mesquite Friendship. That's really not my concern. All I really need to focus on are the folks that God gives me to pastor. And since I know you quite well, I do know what's jumping off at the stone. <laughs> so though it's not specific, it's general. It can be specifically applied to my own spiritual condition. And one of the immediate areas that I know all of us need to grow is in the area of faith. Especially when there's a mess in my life. Oh, okay. Ain't nobody no mess going on in your life. Ha. All right. The Hebrew writer says, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's, that's New King James. NFA puts puts it this way. It says, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. The Message Bible puts it this way. I don't often quote the Message Bible because it throws some folk for a loop. But let, me, let me just quote how it says in a paraphrastic version of the Bible. Listen to what the Message says. It says, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. Let me read that again. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. That term in the Greek about faith is, is, it stands for something that's underneath, upon which we stand on. Yeah. 
So, so, so faith undergirds everything upon which we attempt to stand. What you don't realize is that you automatically have faith in something. You demonstrated faith when you sat down in that chair. You believed that that chair would hold you up because it was firm under you. And you know this is because Sunday after Sunday, you sit in a chair that holds you and is underneath you. Well, let me talk to somebody. The reason you have faith in God is every day you come to learn and to discover that underneath you is a faith supplied by an almighty and powerful God upon which you've chosen to stand and it has never let you down because the God you serve has never let you down. That's faith. That's belief. That's trust because you know that God is good. Yeah. He's done it before and he'll do it again. He's healed before and he'll heal again. He's delivered before and he'll deliver again. He's opened doors before and he'll open them again because he's God. I trust him because I know him. I hold on because he ain't never let me go. Even in my mess, I wish I had a witness in here that could quit acting so holy and understand that oh, even in my mess, he's held me close. Even when I didn't act right, he held me close. When I didn't want to go, he sent me anyway, and he kept me safe. That's why I'm too much worried about sophisticated Christians with your funny looking self. Upon close examination, you don't look so good either. We must grow in faith. The part of sanctification that deals with faith is speaking in terms of our spiritual condition as it relates to trusting in God. In our scripture text today, I preached this a couple of times here, but I'm looking at it from the lens of faith. And specifically, faith that grows in the middle of a mess. You don't understand the mess that and they found themselves, and you got to understand the broader context. In chapter 17 of 2 Chronicles, Jehoshaphat assumes the throne after his father Asa in what is a what was a divided kingdom. You had Judah to the south and Israel to the north. They were it was split. You remember Jeroboam and Rehoboam, uh, Nehemiah, uh, 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 what's his name? I forget his name. Uh, his son, they sons, they they split the kingdom. They split the kingdom, and you had you had you had Israel to know Judah to the south. Keep in mind that Judah. That Judah, Judah means pray. Yeah. So, so whenever I preach this, I have people to understand something about the Judah tribe. The, the, the tribe of Judah is where Jesus, his lineage comes from. He was, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He, 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 see, Judah, Judah had to make it no matter what went down. Because, see, Judah was praising that, that that would allow Jesus to come through. Judah was going to make it no matter what. So, so embedded within Judah is the church. Because Jesus came through. Jesus died, right? Y'all know Jesus, right? J Jesus died on the cross, died for our sins, and gave birth to the church. So in, in, within praise was the church. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Was praise in the church? Or uh, was, was praise the church? Or was the church praise? Or uh, was praise the church or was church praise? Or... Uh, 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 it don't make no difference because praise is the essence of our being. Praise is what we ought to do just because of what he did. Judah had to make it and when you understand that you come through some Judah, that means you got to have some praise because it makes no difference what mess you might be in. When praises go up, blessings still have a way of coming down no matter where you might find yourself in 
life. He's on the throne. And the Bible says in chapter 3, 17 that he walked in the ways of David. He didn't walk in the ways of his daddy. His daddy's name was Asa. And Asa did not act right. Asa didn't, didn't do what he was supposed to do. So how many of you know that God will take, take care of, of his children for his purposes? He didn't act like his daddy. He went back to King David. And we know King David didn't act right all the time either. But God had a way of letting him know if you stay with me and walk in my ways, I'll be right there with you. Jehoshaphat in the Bible says God was with him. But how many of you know even when God is with you, when you get chapter 18, in chapter 18, Jehoshaphat started making a mess. Yeah. Jehoshaphat started to align himself with other nations that did not share in the same ideals and principles of the children of Israel. Y'all to get that on CNN. Yeah. He began to align himself with other nations that did not share in the same idealistic principles, godly principles that they had in mind when God gave birth to Israel. Strangely enough, it was his cousins to the north. Your cousins will mess you up every time. Yeah. It was, it was kid folk to the north, y'all. The tribes in the north were led by Ahab. Y'all know Ahab, don't you? Ahab was married to Jezebel. And Jezebel was really calling the shots. And Jezebel came from a family that worshipped Asherah. Asherah was what was a goddess. And Asherah was known for having poles. Yeah, they put their poles in worship. Oh, ain't nobody talking to me. That's all right. I, I know this messing y'all up. But, but, but the astropoles would be in worship. And they were known for all sorts of illicit behavior in their worship services. That's why you got to watch what goes on in worship. Every shake ain't a holy shake. Every hug ain't a holy hug. Every word is not a holy word to be expressed. You got to be careful about what spirits Folks are under the influence of even in your worship service. But she had Ahab on the string. So Ahab approaches Jehoshaphat and said, man, won't you hook up with your kinfolk and let us go down and let's go to war. Jehoshaphat unwisely says yes. But in an element of wisdom, he asked for a confirmation from the Lord. It's in chapter 18. He says, don't you have some prophets of the Lord that could give us a word from the Lord. Ahab says yes. He goes and gets 400 men and they say yes. God has told us to tell you to go down and go to war with Ramoth Gilead. Go head on. Jehoshaphat understanding a few things. He says but now this is 400 prophets of your own. He says is there not a man of God in town that can give us a word. Ahab said yeah that's somebody in town. His name is Micaiah. But every time I ask him something, he tells me the contrary to what I want to do. Uh, so I didn't call him up. Uh, he said, Jehoshaphat said, that's just the person we need to call. Uh, somebody that'll give us a word uh, from the Lord. Can I park here parenthetically and let me help somebody? See, every, if every time you get a word from the Lord, it's positive for you. That problem is not the right word for you. Because every now and then, the prophet of God, the preacher of God, the pastor of God, uh, got to deal with sin. Uh, every now and then, the prophet of God, the pastor of God, the preacher of God, uh, got to tell us like it T.I. is. Uh, got to tell us what time it really is. Uh, not only with y'all, but with his own self. Uh, every now and then, the preacher, prophet, pastor, got to preach the word of God. Uh, got to stand and withstand the wiles of the devil. Uh, and got to tell everybody, fall out of your wicked ways. Uh, turn from sin. Uh, Get right and get holy. What you're doing is wrong. It ain't always kumbaya. It ain't always God gonna bless you abundantly. Sometimes this God can't bless you abundantly until you get faithful over a few things. But 
Jehoshaphat didn't heed the prophet. He didn't listen. So he goes to war against the Syrians, against the prophet Micaiah's word. And if you read that text in chapter 18, it's quite interesting. The prophet told him not to go. Matter of fact, he told him the vision that I'm getting. Ahab says, you ain't going to return. And Ahab got slit. Ahab took his, his, his priestly garments off, his kingly garments off, I should say. And said, I'm going to ride in in disguise. Jehoshaphat, you keep yours on. And so the enemy came out to Jehoshaphat, but Jehoshaphat hollered, holler if you hear me. Jehoshaphat screamed. How many of you know, boy, when that devil get on your trail, a uh, folk will go to hollering, won't they? Oh, I know because I've experienced it. And I know I'm not by myself. Uh, when all hell is busting loose in your life, uh, when there's a mess on your address street, uh, when there's something going on in your world, uh, holler if you hear me. Uh, that's the thing that you'll find yourself hollering for uh, when the devil get on your trail. But thanks be to God, uh, God was not through with Jehoshaphat. Uh, and he turned them away from him. Uh, and they took Ahab out, just like the prophet said. Ahab. He didn't make it. But chapter 19, the prophet Jehu lets Jehoshaphat know, man, you've created, you've created a mess. He married, his son married into Ahab's family. And, and when Ahab, when Jehoshaphat died, down the line in chapters 22, you can find this. The son of his wife, his son Jeho Jehoram's wife, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, when he died, she took the throne and she tried to kill every descendant of David. She tried to destroy Jesus' seed. But her evil and wicked self. Yeah, Jehoshaphat did not take heed to long-term strategic thinking. He was settling for the immediacy of the moment. And as a consequence, he gave long-term problems for the descendants of Judah. And he created a mess. And Jehu had to tell him, he said, man, you, you really messed up. You created a mess. He went to try to straighten things out. But when you get to our scripture text in chapter 20, the mess finds its way to his doorstep. When you look at chapter, verse 1 of chapter 20, tells us that some enemies began to line themselves up and make their way to Judah's doorstep. And my first point on the day is how God can use perplexing problems to produce a growing faith. I can stand here and give witness to you that many of my problems, when I made it through them, I was better for them. Yeah. Y'all yeah, don't want to say nothing. That's all right. When I made it through the thing, I found myself better because of the thing. I was wiser. I was more prayerful. I was a little slower than I used to be on decision making. I was more prudent. I asked more questions. I slowed my roll. I peak game better. I recognized game when it was in my face. I got a whole lot better. I began to understand the wiles of the devil. I began to understand a little bit more. Every problem I've gone through, I found myself better. God can use perplexing problems to help our faith to grow. I hope I'm helping somebody already because you're perplexed right now. Can't figure it out right now. Well, quit trying to figure it out and watch and be patient and be still while God works the thing out. If you hold on and be still, that can testify uh, that you held no long enough uh, to see God work. He uses perplexing problems to produce great faith. 
when you see these problems and you get to verse 4, we now see that God has a way of growing our faith if we would demonstrate a trust in him through prayer. Growing faith in God is often demonstrated by praying, praying to God. When we pray to God, we're saying we need him. When we pray to God, we say we're dependent upon him. When we pray to God, we're saying we are submitting it to him. Praying alone is all right. But when you've got a corporate problem, you need corporate prayer. And when you look at verse 4, the people of Judah, watch this, the people of praise came together to seek help from the Lord. I'm perplexed right here. Why didn't they seek help from Ahab's cousins up north? Why didn't they seek help from anybody else? The Bible says they, seek, they sought help from the Lord. Can I give you my theory as to why? It's because they had come to learn to trust God in the middle of the mess. Yeah. They thought Jehoshaphat had it, but Jehoshaphat messed up anyway. So the people of pray, the people of Judah come together to seek help from the one who they have come to know has not ever failed them just yet. They come to seek help from an almighty God who they have come to learn that when nothing else will help, the Lord has always been there for me. When, when nobody else was there, God was always there. They came to seek help from the Lord God Almighty. The leadership learned, Reverend Eccles, how to pray. I noticed he didn't pray when he talked to Ahab. He asked Ahab to go find some prophets. Oh, but when the enemy came to his doorstep this time, Jehoshaphat is growing in the middle of the mess. He's learning that I'm going to talk to God first for myself. Can I personally testify uh, all the mistakes I made in five years? After five years, you learn to pray to God about everything. You learn to talk to God about anything. You learn to ask God, God, what color Kool-Aid do they like? You learn to pray to God and say, God, what tree do I need not touch? Yeah, that, that was real. Y'all missed that. that yeah, we, we cut off the trees and, and we almost had to have a confessional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you learn to talk to God about everything. And, and, and listen, my brothers and sisters, in your walk with the Lord, as you grow, learn to pray about everything and if you don't get peace in your heart, be still and wait on God to give you some clarity cause that's better than what Jehoshaphat did in the previous chapter when he created such a mess that would impact generations to come it's better to be still and it's better to be patient than to act Hastily, not understanding what God wants you to do. He prayed. But look, look, look at what he was saying in the prayer. I'm not, I'm not going to go through the entire prayer. But, but one thing jumped out at me, verse 9 says that God's name was on the house. This harkens back to Solomon's day when, 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 they, when, they, when they consecrated the temple, the first temple, and, and the God's Shekinah glory rested on the house. Jehoshaphat was reminding God of the promise he gave them that, that, that Lord you said that if anything comes against your house if anything comes against your people that if we would come to this place this place of consecration this place where your Shekinah glory rests this place where the holies of holies dwell if we would come to this place and call upon your name you say Somebody already there. 
Somebody already there. Somebody already at the throne. Somebody already in the throne room. Is there anybody ever had to go to the throne room? Is there anybody ever had to get down to the altar? Is there anybody that ever had to get down on your knees and call on an almighty God because you were in such a mess that you couldn't see your way through? You couldn't find your way through? You needed a power other than yourself. Get to the throne room of God. Joseph, I pray that I'm going to remind you, God, of your word. Some of y'all been here long enough to know one of the first series we taught in this church was how to pray. And one of the things I taught the church, I said, listen, one thing you need to learn how to start doing is praying God's word back to him. Oh, when you get down in the scriptures and you learn to pray God's word back to him, guess what you're doing? You're calling on the one who is not like man that he should lie. He's not like man that he has to repent. His word is yes and amen. And if he promised it, he can deliver. This was Judah, like I told you earlier. They had to make it. God had to deliver them. God had to rescue them. You are the church. God has to deliver you. God will deliver you because you are a city that sits on a hill that can't be hid. God will come to your rescue. I'm going to give you two minutes to think about all the time. God has come to your rescue. I'm going to wait on him. I'm going to wait on you. 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 Think about that other time. Think about that time before that. Oh, what about that other time? Think about all the time God came to your rescue. What about that other time? What about yesteryear? What about yesterday? What about 15 years ago? What about last week? Is there anybody glad that God came to your rescue? Is there anybody thankful that God brought you out? <laughs> Joseph, I pray. He said, Lord, you said that if we pray, if we call upon your name, you come to this place and you'd rescue us. Growing faith in God is demonstrated by prayer to God. Verses 4 through 13, he was praying, family, friends, saints, develop an attitude of prayer. God. In verse 12, he admits something. And when he gets done, he says, God, I'm, I'm admitting something. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. See, see, deliver me all these super Christians that know everything to do. See, sometimes life can get so perplexing and problems can get so thick that you got to hit me, Lord, I don't even know what to do. When doctors read off a word you don't even understand, they never seen it in your life, Lord, I don't know what to do. When everything is coming against you when you don't know what to do. When the children that don't seem they ever want to act right, get right in spite of everything you've tried to do. Uh, you got to admit, Lord, I don't know what to do. Uh, when your spouse ain't acting right, Lord, I don't know what to do. Uh, when the church ain't acting right, you got to say, Lord, I don't even know what to say no more. Uh, I don't even know how to address it anymore. Uh, I don't even know what to do no more. But he said, that's one thing I've learned in my life, uh, that if I'm on your side, you're more than the world against me. Uh, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to watch you do what you do. Uh, is there anybody glad uh, that we've got a God uh, that does what he does? He knows what to do. He knows how to do it. He knows when to do it. So I don't know what to do, but I'm going to get my eyes. I'm going to get my eyes. I'm going to get my heart and my mind. I'm going to get my focus on the one who put me in focus. I'm going to put my mind on you, oh God, because I don't know what to do. It's like living life at an intersection. And you got four ways to go. And three of them wrong. There's only one right, right, right way. And most often, we go with the 75%. And we get it wrong. And we create a myth. Had Jehoshaphat prayed a few years ago, 
he wouldn't even be in this mess. I know I'm talking to somebody. Had you known what you know now, you wouldn't be in this. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me. That's all right. I know you well. I told you I'm your pastor. Yeah, had you known then what you know now, you wouldn't even be in the mess that God got to get you out of. Am I, you know, I have a witness in this place uh, that don't mind telling the truth about the thing uh, that had I heard a word a few years ago, uh, I wouldn't be in this mess right now. But God is so good uh, that it makes no difference. Uh, he'll still bring you out. Uh, he'll still set you free. Uh, he'll still make a way. Uh, he'll still love on you. He'll still deliver you because you are his. Uh, Oh, my goodness. Getting out to the prayer. And, and, and I understand that you don't know what to do. But put your eyes on the Lord. Well, here's my last point. Growing faith in, trust God in the middle of the mess. Let's, let's work that. Growing faith, trust God in the middle of the mess. Let, let's look at verses 14 through 20 and we can run. Watch this, watch this, watch this. After they pray, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came, comes upon Jehaziel. And for those that are not familiar with dispensational theology, understand that the Spirit of the Lord came upon persons in the Old Testament and indwells us in the New. So the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Jehaziel, son of Zachariah. And I don't know why they put all his daddies and kinfolk name in him, but, but I'm going to have to research that. But, but God skipped that just going on what it said. He stood in the assembly and he says, listen, king, and all of y'all that are here in Jerusalem, this is what God says. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged because of this vast army. One reason is because this particular battle is not yours. But, 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 but wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute. When the Lord told him to inhabit the land, he told him to destroy everybody in the land. But this particular group of people, he says, this one is mine. I wish I had some Bible students. They can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 2 and understand that that one group he said not to touch was this group. In other words, God gave their relatives some grace. These were descendants of Noah. These were descendants of the children. They were really related. And so God said, leave them alone and go around them. God gave them grace. But wait a minute. Here they come trampling on the grace of God. God said, no, let me deal with this one. How many of you know that's some battles? God said, no, I got this on your behalf. Ain't there anybody glad that God steps in, he steps in and say, don't you worry about a thing, baby. Uh, I got this one. Uh, it's like a husband uh, getting in front of a wife. Uh, fool with Sister Millie if you want to. Uh, baby, you stay cute. Uh, you stay good looking. Uh, let me get some scrapes and some bruises on your behalf. Uh, I got this one. Uh, fool with Naomi if you want to. Uh, I got this one. Uh, fool with Little Harvey if you want to. Uh, I got this one. Uh, fool with me if you want to. Daddy got this one up. God got this one up. God says, I got this one up. They trample on my grace up. I set them free up. God said, this one ain't got nothing to do with you. And I just wonder how many of us are fighting the wrong fight. You know when you're fighting the wrong white fight? Because we keep losing. God ain't never lost. But when you're in a mess, there's this thing called the fog of war. To where your enemies look like friends and your friends look like enemies. Mm -hmm. And here comes some friendly looking folk that God said, really, your enemies. Joseph said, Lord, you know we gave them for grace when we came in here. God said, this one is mine. I'm going to fight this one on your behalf. Isn't it good to know 
that God has a perspective about our circumstances that we don't quite grasp and understand when you're going through the mess. You can't quite figure everything out. You become discombobulated and sometimes inebriated on guilt and on sin and on pain. And you can't quite figure out which way you need to go. But then you get yourself up and get to worship. And before you leave worship, God has given you a word from somebody that said, don't you even worry about this thing. If you think back over your life and you think things over, I've already brought you through. I've already set you free. I've already made a way. And all you've got to do is trust that even this mess, I'm going to see you through. Growing faith, trust God in the middle of the mess. Well, preacher, why could you say it's the middle of the mess? I saw when the mess begun, and I've read where it's going to end. So that means they somewhere in the middle. Am I right? When you think back over things, when you get to the middle, you can sort of start to see where it started. And when you're in the middle, you can almost begin to see how, how it's going to eat. But the struggle with the middle of the mess is sometimes we want to go back and deal with how it started. Look at them. They act like they don't even know me no more. Ooh, if I could, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, I feel with the Holy Ghost. And then you turn and say, huh, I serve God Almighty. If I just hold on just a little while longer, I'm just in the middle of the mess. If I can just be, be patient. If I could just hang on in there. As a matter of fact, Jehoshaphat told him, he said, why don't y'all do this? If you be still, you're going to see the salvation of the Lord. And the prophet gives them good pinpoint GPS coordinates upon where your enemy is going to be. And he said, this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to get back up again. And you're going to have to start moving from this middle. And you're going to have to start going toward the end. And you got to start looking and seeing what God's going to do. Well, wait a minute. You said your eyes. We're watching God. Well, if your eyes are on God's channel, how many of you know God gonna get you something to see? The other day I was watching Little Coco, Little Coco, Little Coco over there in Wimbledon. Little Coco hitting them ball. Little Coco playing tennis. Little Coco, 15 years old. I looked at Little Coco. They had a down in the third set. Little Coco said she gurned her lawns. She pulled up her britches. Little Coco, 15 years old. Little Coco said, I ain't going down like this. I ain't going out like this. She hit a winner down the side, uh, and before you know it, she looked up in the stands, uh, looked at mama, and looked at daddy, and said, what time uh, is it? Uh, it's cocoa time. Uh, watch me win this thing. Uh, I wish I had some cocoa folk in the house uh, that had enough courage uh, to know that you've been hit with some. Uh, you've been knocked down a couple of times, uh, but can you get your cocoa on? Uh, pull your faithful britches up uh, and hit some winners down the side, uh, and watch God make a way for you. Any Coco Christians uh, in the house uh, that don't know my understanding uh, that God uh, is going to work through you uh, if you participate. God says y'all going to have to go see and go see me work. Uh, so you're going to have to get up uh, and get to moving uh, because faith without works is dead all by itself. Uh, deliver me from folk. Mama started that want to be set free, but don't want to move from the middle. You know, middle dwellers are people that are unstable. Bible says halting between two opinions. Were you going to serve God or are you going to serve man? What you going to do? How long are you going to hang in that middle? How long are you going to be lukewarm about this thing? How long are you going to still keep dealing with the same thing you're dealing with? You already know what you need to do. When are we going to start moving from the middle and start moving into the place of abundance and blessings that God has for his people? Growing faith, trust in God in the middle of the mess. 
when I look down at the remaining verses of Reverend Bell, I see something else. That when you start moving from the middle and you get the exact location of your enemy, verse 16, and you realize that there ain't no need for you to fight. I told you earlier, there's still something you got to do. Verse 18 and 19 of our scripture text says that they started to worship. They started praise. Now God didn't give them exact details on how they would win. And Jehoshaphat prayed to him and said, Lord, we don't know what to do. But it looked like they knew what to do. Yeah. When you don't know what to do, start doing what you already know. Yeah. Let me just read the verse. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Verse 18 said, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korahites praised him. They stood up. Some bowed down. And some stood up. Some worshiped. While others praised. Praise and worship go together. And when you've got a perplexing problem that comes a mess and you don't know what to do, I dare you to worship and praise. It sounds to me that they knew enough about God to know that he's worthy of their worship and their praise in spite of the mess that they found themselves in. Most often, when it gets real bad, we don't worship or praise. We complain. When we create it, I wish I had somebody. I wish. So somebody ought to be smiling right now. See, because you might be in a mess today. But I just gave you some good news. I just showed you what God's word say you ought to start doing. I dare you to start worshiping. And I dare you to start giving God some praise. Because when you praise God, uh, you're praising him for what he's already done. Uh, that if he don't get me out of this mess, uh, he's already done enough. Uh, and in response to your worship and your praise, guess what God does? God says, this is mine. This is my battle. Watch me go to work. But there's something else in this text that you got to get. They're going to worship and they're going to praise and God's going to fight. Watch this in verse 21. The Bible says that they're praising God. And verse 22 says that as they began to sing and praise, the Lord said ambushes against the men of Ammon, against the men of Moab and Mount Seir. And when you look down at verse 26, the, the, the location is vital. He, God does his work in the valley of Barakah. Yeah. Barakah in the Hebrew means blessing. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Let's, let's connect that dot. They didn't know what to do, so they started worshiping and praising. God leads them into the valley of Barakah. Barakah in the Hebrew means blessing. They start worshiping and praising. God sends them to the valley of blessing to see how he was going to bless them. Because praise produces abundant blessing. So if you're in a mess and you want to be blessed, God's got a valley of Barakah with your name on it. If you would learn, and I would learn, that if I praise him, he's got to meet me with a blessing. Because praise, blessings follow praise. So even though they did not have a strategic 
a strategic victory plan. And that was, whatever you going to do, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but one thing I know is every time I lift up my voice and give you praise, uh, strange blessings start finding me. Strange blessings start looking for me. Uh, God said, go to your place of blessing uh, and watch me be a blessing. Uh, you know what happened? God didn't only bless them spiritually. He blessed them materially. When he did disturbed all the enemies and they destroyed themselves, they didn't destroy the stuff. Everybody in here must have hit the lotto. So Jody, everybody in here got paper. Everybody in here got it together already. Everybody in here don't need nothing. Everybody in here don't need no new car. Don't nobody in there need no new house. See, see, scripturally, this is how you get abundant blessings. It's when you're faithful and obedient to God. Uh, God says, you can ask the desires of your heart and I'll give it to you because God going to make sure that his children are taken care of. Uh, and when you get to the valley of blessing, uh, you've already been in a mess. Uh, you already need a blessing. And God says, I've got an abundant supply and it's coming from your enemies. Because I know how to make your enemy your footstool. And the one that will go trample on you, I'm going to let you know how to trample over them. And when you get down into the valley of blessings, it looks like it's a low place. But God says, I've got some high blessings for you with your name on it. Is there anybody here that's ready to be blessed by God? Is there anybody here that's caught up in a mess right now? And all you need is to give God praise for what he's already done. Worship his name for who he is. And God says, I'll send a blessing your way. Any blessed folks in the house, any blessed people in the house, then you ought to testify uh, that God uh, and his amazing grace, uh, how sweet it sounded uh, when it saved uh, an old wretch like me. Uh, thank you for your blessings. Uh, thank you for my mess. Uh, Cause God uh, has delivered me. And I'm so thankful. I've learned that in the messes of life comes the greatest growth. And if you just hang on in there, in your mess, you'll find that you're going to grow. You go through it. When I was doing a devotion the other week, doing this devotion the other week, I get a, get a flash point devotional. And it was at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I popped up and I read it. And it brought back to my remembrance some scriptures that I've always read. I said, remember the Hebrew boys? God didn't deliver them from the fiery furnace. He delivered them through it. Say, so remember the children of Israel? He said, God didn't deliver them from the Red Sea. He delivered them through the Red Sea. But I'm trying to tell somebody, unfortunately, you got to go through it. And he's going to bless you through it. See, Christians got to quit fighting and whining about every little problem. You've got to learn to get you some spiritual backbone. And learn how to trust God through it when you're in the middle of your mess. Looking back, wishing you could do something about how it started. When God is saying, no, I'm trying to show you to the valley of Barakah. There's a blessing with your name on it. And too many of us come up short. We quit. We throw in the towel when the door was right there. And all I had to do was keep worshiping, keep praising, keep moving. That don't always mean you're going to smile. It doesn't always mean you're going to feel good. But what it does mean that through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he'll give you enough power to get back up on your feet again and to turn that thing around and to trust in the Lord God, your Almighty, that he is the one that is your Jehovah M. Kadesh, the Lord, your sanctifier. 
and he's trying to sanctify you and move us all from the middle of that mess to the place of blessing as my faith continues to grow. Reverend Bell, when I make it to the place and open the door and see my blessing, when you keep reading, they got all of the blessings. And when they went back to Jerusalem, they didn't go home. They went to the temple with their blessing and laid it at the feet of the Lord. And they had church before they went home. And I can just about imagine that after they got through with church at church, they had church at home. Is there anybody here that can testify? That good church at home and church at church goes together. And when you get God with you, all you got to do is stay with God uh, and don't forget where your blessing came from. It came from a valley of blessings. All because you didn't stop in your mess. You stayed with God. I wish I had some messy folk that'll stand up and give God a shout in the place. I wish I had some honest, messy folk that don't mind letting somebody know, oh, I've had some messes. I've had my share of mess. Oh, but good God Almighty, I come to find out that I'm growing in my mess. growing in my mess. My faith is growing. I'm getting a whole lot better. And when I go through my mess, I always look back on my mess to give my lesson. I give my lesson, Dick Miller, learn my lesson. I told y'all about that old rag the car about. I had to call my daddy and then he went off on them folk. He wasn't Dick Miller then, he went way off on them. Oh, he went off on them because he did his boy bad. Did it, boy, bad. I didn't read the fine print. I come out of that print, almost 22% interest on an old rag to come my first car. Now, I'm grown a little harder. I'm grown a little harder. I'm grown. My first car, I'm going to get it on my own. I ain't going to talk to my daddy. He don't know nothing. I'm 18. Grown. Get me a car. Give me the car. Drive the car to the hood. Show it all the homies. What's up? What's up? Parked the old car, clean, red, shine. When I parked it, one of the homies walked up and said, Say, Doc, I see some smoke coming from your car. I said, No, can't be mine, because I just bought this brand new car, only to realize it was an as is used. So I had to call my daddy and say, Daddy, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to watch you do what you need to do, and I'm going to grow watching you. And when I watched him negotiate and get the mess off my credit, I learned something from watching my daddy do what he do. Go in them places and talk plenty of noise. Let them know you ain't got no money. You ain't trying to have no problems. And if I don't like the car, I'm going to turn around and leave it. He said, always be ready, son, uh, to walk away from the deal. Uh, and I've been using that principle all my life. Uh, ain't never got burned because uh, I was watching my daddy go through the thing. Uh, and when he went through the thing, uh, I learned from the thing because uh, my eyes uh, was watching my dad. Uh, and I ain't never been burned like that again. Uh, look back over your life. Uh, learn from your mess uh, and say, devil, you ain't getting me like that no more. Uh, you got me that time, uh, but you ain't going to catch me slipping. Uh, you ain't going to catch me tripping. Uh, you ain't going to catch me out past 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to get my butt uh, straight on up to the house uh, because God uh, has been too good uh, to let the devil keep stealing your joy. I've learned from
from my mess. I've gotten better through my mess. Faith grows in the middle of the mess. And I pray that we've got some folks that don't mind growing even when things get messy. Give God praise in the house. Give God